Well, as I say, good evening. Welcome to class number two out of five on Christian apologetics, overcoming modern barriers to faith. In the first class, you might recall, we recapped one of the linchpins of secular culture, which is all knowledge to be valid and true must be empirical. I can verify it through experiments or what I see or through instruments. And that physics is itself adequate to explain the origin of the universe and all the laws within it. And we saw that those explanations are inadequate, that scientism, which is the claim that all knowledge to be valid much, must take the form of scientific knowledge, fails on its own uh, premise because what experiment would you refer to to make the claim that all our knowledge is based upon experiments? It's a circular argument and ultimately it's a fallacious argument. So we saw one of the linchpins of secular culture is false, that uh, physics is not adequate to explain origins or the being of the universe, and that that claim about knowledge is arbitrary, and we'll poke at that more as we go uh, tonight. So tonight's class is a positive uh, class. So last week was about poking holes at Stephen Hawking and people like that. Uh, tonight is to show what are the evidences for uh, the existence of God in physics and metaphysics. And so if you advance in your uh, deck, uh, what we will cover uh, tonight is what do we see in a consideration of physics that points to the existence of a being outside of the universe and for the beginning of our universe. We'll then spend some time discussing classical metaphysics. Now that term metaphysics always sounds a little spooky or science fiction-like. If you walk into a, a Barnes and Noble, usually metaphysics is right next to the occult and spiritual rebirth books and books on granola. So uh, we're gonna clarify what that has traditionally meant and what it still means today. I will continue along that path of, of developing in an initial way our understanding of metaphysics and talk about some of the arguments for the existence of God from reason alone, apart from faith. Uh, and we will explore those and I think you'll find them very interesting. One of the classic problems that immediately presents itself once we become comfortable that the existence of God can be demonstrated is what about the problems we see in the world on a gigantic scale, the problem of evil. How could a good God allow, tolerate, observe uh, the tremendous evils? And is that not an argument against the existence of God? How could there be a good God when there's tremendous evil and violence in the world? So that's the light subjects we're going to cover tonight, uh, and uh, away we go. So. In the first class, we looked at what was called Big Bang Cosmology, and we looked at it primarily in the context of Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design, but it's something that is generally accepted and, sh and is very provocative, showing a beginning of the universe. But there are other things as well that we can point to just from the natural sciences, mathematics as well. The law of entropy we will look at briefly, and please don't worry, we're, this won't turn into a physics class, but I just wanna give you a flavor of this as very provocative within the natural sciences of a beginning of the universe. We'll then talk about the impossibility of what I call and what uh, Father Robert Spitzer calls in his books, uh, the impossibility of an actual infinite pastime. Many atheistic scientists will talk about infinities uh, as a way of explaining our existence. There are an infinite number of universes, there's been an infinite number of time that preceded our current moment. We don't need a God, we don't need a creator. We have infinity to explain origins and being of the universe. So we will look at how that notion is ultimately absurd and unintelligible. And it's also evidence of a beginning of our universe. So. That's how we'll start, and then don't worry, we'll pause for questions. So why don't we go to the next page? Entropy. 
You won't necessarily come across this in your crossword puzzle uh, each morning, but it is the second law of thermodynamics, and in any freshman in high school physics text, they will refer to this. Uh, certainly in any college textbook, uh, they will, if you take physics, they will refer to the second law of thermodynamics, which I define here as it is a measure of disorder in a closed physical system that increases over time. Now, thermodynamics typically studies heat transfers in, in engines, which is historically how this uh, evolved. However, the law is broader than just heat. Uh, and so what this law is really about is that given the law of probability, things will tend to unravel over time. Things will tend to become more uh, disordered and frankly more probable because of that. So let me give you an example. I have here the book War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. 1,456 pages. It's a long book. Suppose I cut off the binding so that the pages were free but still in order and then on a windy day I tossed it up into the air. What would happen? Would the pages come down on the ground in order or in a stack neatly at my feet? No, they wouldn't. Suppose I did it again to get it back in order. Would I improve my chances or would they become even more remote that they came down in order? More remote. That's entropy at work by analogy. The more times I toss the pages up in the air, the more out of place they get, the more disordered they get. Also, it's more probable that they're disordered. What's improbable is that they're in sequence. So that initial condition of page one through four, 1456, that initial condition of being in sequence and telling a story, that's what's very improbable and very ordered. If I keep tossing it and keep tossing it, eventually it'll be so jumbled that you might not even recognize it as a novel of war and peace. So that's a, a, a simple example of entropy at work, but you can see entropy at work in all walks of life, in any what I call isolated physical system. Sometimes it's referred to as closed, meaning no magical outside influences that would alter the conditions. So in this case, no one snuck in and, and reordered the pages on the ground when I wasn't looking. That wouldn't be a closed physical system, would it? Someone came off stage and did something. But think about everyday occurrences of uh, scrambling eggs. We don't see eggs fly out of the frying pan and reassemble into eggs that you'd put in a carton. You drop a wine glass on the ground, it breaks. We don't ever see in nature the fragments coming back together. And yet we know that physical laws should be indifferent to their time arrow. What's interesting about entropy is that it's a one-way arrow from ordered and improbable to disordered and more probable. So always remember the example of the book and it's a good way of thinking about entropy. Entropy increases over time or stays the same but typically increases over time uh, to a more disordered, more probable condition. The universe is a closed physical system. There's nothing else. There's no magical influences according to the atheistic science outside of the universe. Whether you're talking one universe or multiverses, there is nothing else. And yet we know that um, our universe is in a, in a state of expansion and cooling. And this can be measured and we talked about a bit how that is measured when we were talking about uh, the cosmic background, uh, micro background radiation that can be measured by uh, 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 telescope, not telescopes, but the Hubble spacecraft that are measuring the cosmic background uh, radiation. But if we had an infinite pastime, we should be at what's called heat death of our universe, namely very cold. If we had an infinite actual amount of time up to this stage, why aren't, why aren't we at heat death? Why isn't the entire universe very, very cold right now? 
and it's not, as we know. So this is indicative of the fact that there is a real beginning to our universe. Not appealing to religion, not appealing to the Bible, not appealing to the book of Genesis, just taking the second law of thermodynamics and the fact that we are not at heat death right now in our universe. It is provocative and indicative of a real beginning because if there was actual infinite pastime, it would be very cold right now. So the first argument uh, from science, from physics, of a beginning to our universe is the second law of thermodynamics applied to our universe. Are people clear on what I'm getting at with what is entropy and the implications of that for our universe that there is not an actual infinite pastime? You can you can do examples of entropy for yourself, flipping a coin, flipping 10 coins from an initial condition and seeing the probability change over time. That's entropy. So if you had 10 coins and, you, and let's say heads was one and tails was zero and you started them all out as heads, that would be a value of 10. What's the probability of having 10 on the next iteration? Very small. That's entropy. The law of probability, think of it as a decaying of an initial condition that's ordered. So let's continue. The word infinity is often used by uh, secular uh, physicists and uh, Infinity is a term in mathematics, it's, it's a term that intimidates people because we don't have a, a good experience of it, but it's often used by atheistic physicists as their explanation for how do we get something from nothing. Now infinity is used in three senses interchangeably and that's a problem. So the first sense of infinity that we're accustomed to as Christians is God is infinite. God is the fullness of being. He is an actual and infinite. And so we're comfortable with that. Uh, we understand that. Another sense of infinity that's used interchangeably, unfortunately, and it confuses people, is infinity as an indefinite series. The even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, there's no end to it. It's indefinite. But is that an actual infinity? In the sense of being a realized, achieved infinity. And the answer is no. It's a potential infinity. It's based upon someone numbering indefinitely. An actor, an agent numbering out, going from 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 to 18. So when you read in science books people talking about actual infinities, this is typically what they're talking about, but they're misleading you because it's not an actual infinity, it's a potential infinity. It's based upon an agent, an actor, numbering. But it's not an actual infinity. You know, the third, uh, before I go to the third sense of infinity, for those of you who study classical philosophy, or you remember someone named Zeno, or you remember the story of the tortoise and the hare, uh, basically what Zeno was elaborating was he didn't think motion was real, because if I shoot an arrow from point A to point C, it still has to go from point A to one half that distance. And then it has to go one-fourth that distance. And then it has to go one-sixteenth and one-thirty-second and one-sixty-fourth. It can never traverse an infinity of points. Therefore, motion is an illusion. And Zeno, a, a, a Greek philosopher before Christ, advanced these propositions. That reality, the true nature of reality is static. Motion is an illusion because you can't traverse an infinity of points. If I want to walk from here to that wall, 
I have to walk half the distance first. I have to walk a quarter of the distance before I walk half. I have to walk an eighth before I walk a quarter, and so on. And that can be done infinitely. So how do I get to the wall? That was Zeno's problem. And that's the problem which was resolved by Aristotle of making potential infinities actual. Because of course I can walk to the wall. How do I achieve that? I'm actually traversing a finite distance that has a potential to be divided infinitely. But it's only a potential. So that's the second notion of infinity that's often bandied about and by scientists who haven't studied philosophy and for whatever reason choose not to. But they present it as if it's something real and it's not. The third one, which is a mix of the two, is, well, infinities can be in what is called by Father Spitzer in his book an aggregating structure within an aggregating structure like a line segment or like space and time. Space and time can contain actual infinities in a finite way, which if you think about is, is a, a little hard to uh, imagine. But if we continue, this is just another example of what I was saying about walking to that wall or a horse trotting 100 feet. And what is interesting, and I'll just skip to the bottom, is that a, a physicist at the turn of the century named Max Planck, who's one of the contributors to quantum mechanics, actually gives more arguments and evidence that potential infinities are not real. We only have discrete segments of space and time. Reality cannot be infinitely divided. It, it's quantized at a very micro level. And if you study physics and read about Max Planck, you will read more about that. But Zeno's problem, and it's the problem of most modern atheist scientists, is they make potential infinities actual. And we now know, even from Max Planck, that that is impossible. That there are quantum intervals that can't be divided of time and space that he discovered and elaborated and is reused by Einstein. So what's the headline in looking at this? The headline is that physics is actually on the side of showing the impossibility of actual infinities as an explanation for the beginning and being of our universe. You don't have to read the book of Genesis to make that demonstration or be a person of faith to know that our universe uh, does have a beginning. It's not an argument yet for the existence of God, but we can know from the natural sciences that our universe had a beginning, a definitive beginning. Not quite done with infinity yet, so the third one, infinity three. Think about it. An actual infinity in a finite line segment or in space and time, how is that achieved actually? How do I traverse that? How is that even accomplished? How do I get to a now? If I'm traversing an infinite number of intervals, how do I get to now? If I'm traversing an infinite number of steps from the past to now, how did I accomplish that? People will try to elaborate, well, infinity minus one, uh, that's infinity. Uh, is it? If infinity minus one is something finite, then fin something finite plus one equals infinity? No, that doesn't make any sense either. So you see how there is a an odd dilemma, you know, a paradox with the idea of infinities which are bantered around all the time in science textbooks. As I mentioned there, Zeno's paradox reemerges in modern clothing in most works on cosmology by people like uh, Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, people like that that you might read about. And sadly, a lot of it can be taught in freshman level uh, physics classes as physics to people in high school and in college. They're not doing science when they talk that way. They're doing religion or something else to justify their atheism. 
So I don't want to dwell on this too much, uh, but uh, the consequences of, of actual infinities, if you wanted to hang on to that, is how do you make sense of a past, a present, and a future? How is that sequence temporally even achievable? If it can be continually divided, each interval, in, indefinitely and infinitely, how do I make progress? How do I go forward in time? Can't be done. Any comments or questions on that before we, we continue? Heavy lifting at a 7 p.m. on a Tuesday on a beautiful day outside, but uh, it's very important that you realize that science and physics actually point to a beginning of our universe, not to the odd atheism you will read in our very popular literature today. So keep that in mind. So the question was, are there any thinkers of renown that would dispute this? And, and the answer is, of course, yes, there are, uh, depending on how broadly you want to define renown. But certainly, most atheistic theoretical physicists uh, who teach in very prestigious universities and are very obviously intelligent men and women uh, would dispute this. My claim is they're disputing it not on the evidence of science, but on some other agenda that requires atheism, that they bring to the conversation. That's the point I'm making. As I mentioned, and this slide is like a, a palate cleanser. Uh, <laughs> so think of it as uh, a, a grapefruit sorbet in between the pasta and the <laughs> salad. But the beginning of the universe doesn't mean God exists, but it is going to be a premise in something we call metaphysics. Because it begs for explanation then. How, how, how is there something? Okay. So metaphysics, and as I mentioned, this conjures up images of science fiction for most people who, who have not been introduced to this subject. The term metaphysics actually uh, appeared on the top of one of Aristotle's manuscripts and it meant after physics. <laughs> uh, so meta is a prefix in Greek meaning after. You know, maybe he needed a coffee break and he said, okay, I'm done with the physics. Now, whatsoever after physics we'll call metaphysics. And that's the term that has come down through history as the discipline that studies uh, being in its fullness, being characterized in its ultimate nature. And so if you look at the natural science, physics studies things according to a certain method. It studies laws of motion, mechanics, you might throw in other disciplines, optics, we mentioned thermodynamics, fields, energy, matter, and it, it attempts, attempts to explain those things through physical laws, mathematical description, and experiments that create inferences of those laws. You could say biology studies things according to uh, living, organic structure, reproduction, uh, nutrition, etc. You could say, you know, if you ever have any of your kids study organic chemistry, it's different than general chemistry. What makes organic chemistry different? They're studying things that are carbon based. So that's a particular method and point of view as well. You know, metaphysics is not studying created reality, reality from a particular point of view. Motion, energy, magnetism. It's studying reality from a fundamental point of view. How are things real? What does it mean for something to be real? How would we characterize it? So you'll read in the textbooks on metaphysics, metaphysics studies being as being or being as such. As we mentioned in class one, metaphysics in many ways treats subjects that are assumed by all the natural sciences, but are not demonstrated by them. And we touched on some of these before, like nature is rational, that it operates according to laws that we can discover, that mathematics, which is a creation of the human mind, is an apt language to describe the laws of nature, and so on. Does physics demonstrate mathematics? It does not. Does physics demonstrate laws of logic like induction? 
where I take sample one, sample two, sample three, and I make a general law. So Darwin in the Galapagos Islands, the finch beaks uh, are longer and harder consistently over time in this part of the island because they had to chew harder nuts. So he was making inferences from data, induction. That's how the sciences proceed. We talked last class about does this mixture in the lab kill cancer cells? And we repeat experiments under different conditions, uh, and we see that it does. We make an inference that, therefore, this solution, this compound, can be a pharmaceutical to kill cancer cells. That's induction. Does science demonstrate the validity of that inference? No. It uses it, though. So you see there's a host of things that physics itself can't demonstrate, but assumes it in its use. So you begin to see it's not so simple, is it, uh, that other disciplines and a, and a discipline like metaphysics is required to have natural science proceed and function and be valid. You know, this broader view of human reason apart from faith, religious faith, uh, is something that metaphysics seeks to do. And what I've argued in the last class and, and again now is atheists arbitrarily reduce human reason to only knowing what is measurable, what is quantifiable, which is incredibly arbitrary. Because as we've said and as we've seen, what experiment in the lab justifies that empirical method as the exclusive access to true knowledge. Nothing. It's just assumed by the atheist. It's a feedism, almost like a fundamentalist uh, in their view of the Bible. Uh, it, it's a fundamentalism with atheists. And as I mentioned at the bottom there, they've confused the method of science, namely forming conclusions about natural laws based upon the experimental method with the ultimate nature of reality. What's to say that the ultimate nature of reality is limited to our method of investigating it through the natural sciences? Nothing at all. It's just arbitrary by the atheists. You know, people, when they hear metaphysics, uh, often still, and this is usually taught at the end of a philosophy curriculum, so don't be hard on yourselves if, if this is still unclear, because if this is the first time you are exposed to this terminology, it, it feels very weird and unnatural, because you can't associate it to anything uh, typically in your common everyday reading or the natural sciences, though it is present there. Uh, if you read a work on metaphysics, whether it's Aristotle or St. Thomas Aquinas or the commentators, metaphysics is about cultivating wisdom. And they don't mean wisdom in the sense of, of a man with a gray beard and a little Merlin cap on top. What they mean is metaphysics is about ultimate explanations of natural things. It's about ultimate explanations. So what are the terms that are used typically? A distinction, and we'll just run through these because I want to give you a feel of it. We don't have to elaborate these, but people often have questions. Well, what does metaphysics study? What does metaphysics look at? Substance and properties is a classical distinction of a substance is something that exists in itself, like an apple or you. A property is the redness in the apple. It's something that exists in the substance. So the apple can be red, it could be green. You could be 6'2", you could be 5'2". That's a property of you. You could have both legs, you could have lost one leg. That's a property. But you as a human being, that's a substance. It's a classic distinction in metaphysics and natural philosophy. To bring this more down to earth, the Catholic Church, how do they explain the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, just to give you something uh, interesting. Transubstantiation, what's that term all about? Where did that come from? 
But transubstantiation is the term uh, developed by St. Thomas Aquinas to explain how Christ is present in the Eucharist after the manner of a substance. Really, truly, essentially. Not as a property, not as something here today, gone tomorrow, not based upon my subjective conviction that he's present. He is present truly, really. How? Because he's present as a substance. So that's one example in theology uh, where we use the notion of substance that was developed in metaphysics. The four causes. These are the classic causes uh, that are elaborated in Aristotle's opening books in the metaphysics. A material cause of something, a formal, final, and efficient. The examples that are often used is a statue. The material cause of a statue is the marble. The formal cause is the, the design, let's say the pieta. The formal cause configures the material. The efficient cause is Michelangelo and his tools are instrumental efficient causes. Final cause is why did he build it? Beauty and the glory of God. These are the four causes in nature that metaphysics studies. You see how different that is than how physics would study the Pieta as an example, as an artifact. They'd say, well, it weighs about 412 pounds. It's made of this kind of marble found on this mountain. Oh, that's wonderful and true and valid. But you see, when we were talking in the last class about you haven't explained the being of that statue or its true purpose in any of that consideration of physics. Potency and act, these are also terms you'd find in a metaphysics textbook. And it's very similar to our ideas in physics. Something that is in potency means it is capable of having a certain perfection, but it doesn't have it at this present moment. Something in act actually has the perfection, could lose it, but it actually has the perfection. Mm -hmm. So take the example of French. So if you can speak French, write it, and hear it fluently, you have the actual perfection of, of French and being fluent in French. You may not, if you're like me, I forgot all the Fran French I was taught in, in grade school and high school, so I don't have that talent actually. And the same thing is true in reality. Things are in potential in being and in attributes. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of what metaphysics studies and you'll see how provocative and different this is from the natural sciences. And for those of you who are interested in the natural sciences, what is interesting is that their top level of research, they indicate some of these metaphysical categories. So not, I don't want to go into this too far, but Werner Heisenberg wrote a small book based upon some lectures he gave on quantum mechanics, and he talks about substance and potency of the behavior of subatomic particles. Namely, their indeterminate properties were suggestive of him to Aristotle's categories on potency and substance. So I know this sounds somewhat far-fetched, but if you read the literature of, of what, what I'll call honest physicists, theoretical physicists, it points back to classical metaphysics, which is very interesting. If you, for those of you who, who study uh, DNA and the computer code that people talk about on the four nucleotides that are on DNA strands, the four letters, it's highly suggestive of a formal cause because of how DNA nucleotides basically issue uh, genetic assembly instructions to amino acids and build amino acids based upon the sequences on the strand. That is indicative not only of formal cause, but of design. So as the natural sciences keep pushing back the boundaries of our knowledge and, and, and ignorance, the questions of metaphysics actually get larger and larger. So we would do well uh, to study a little more metaphysics in college or high school or even in our leisure. It's heavy going, 
But there's a convergence going on among the natural sciences and classical Aristotelian Thomistic metaphysics. So that's the warm up. <laughs> Any questions? There's no contradiction theoretically in a rock learning French. Just as Jesus said, these mountains would go into the sea if, if you had enough faith to move them. There's no contradiction in it. But it's not a real potency to learn French. So potencies are real, not just logical. They are real. You and I have a logical and a real potency to learn French. But there's no contradiction in somehow understanding how, though it would be contrary to its nature, how a bunch of rocks could, could quote unquote, learn French. Okay. So you might say, Charles, why all this heavy lifting? Why all this dry bones, physics, and metaphysics? Did you know that uh, it's a dogma of our faith that we can know with certitude the existence of God from natural reason alone? Now that sounds ironic. It's a matter of faith that we can know God exists <laughs> by reason alone. But what Thomas Aquinas would say about this is that it pleased God to reveal himself personally through the prophets of the Old Testament and through Jesus Christ in the New because that's how he would reach the most people. But it doesn't obscure the fact that the existence of God can be known naturally by reason alone to the few that want to wander through the castle of metaphysics, which we've done a little wandering today. But if you read uh, this text from Vatican I and then again from Vatican II, which I'll read to you, quote, the same Holy Mother Church holds and teaches that God, the beginning and end of all things, can be known with certitude by the natural light of human reason from created things. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And that's from Paul's letter to the Romans, first chapter. Nevertheless, it pleased his wisdom and goodness to, to reveal himself and the eternal decrees of his will to the human race in another and supernatural way. As the apostle said, God, who at sundry times in diverse or diverse manners spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, last of all in these days has spoken to us by his son. Letter of the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1. So that's from Vatican I, 1870, the dogmatic constitution on God uh, the Father. Vatican II will repeat that in, in 1960. Five. Through divine revelation, God chose to show forth and communicate himself in the eternal decisions of his will regarding the salvation of men. That is to say, he chose to share with them those divine treasures which totally transcend the human, the understanding of the human mind. Matters of faith. They transcend the capabilities of the human mind. As a sacred synod has affirmed, namely Vatican I, God, the beginning and end of all things, can be known with certainty from created reality by the light of human reason. Again, the reference to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. But teaches that it is through his revelation that those religious truths which are by their natures accessible to human reason can be known by all with ease, with solid certitude, and with no trace of error, even in this present state of the human race. So there you have the reaffirmation that the existence of God can be known by natural reason, even though God also reveals himself in many different ways, uh, and definitively through the Old Testament and then in Jesus Christ, his son. So this was just kind of the reminder that all, all the things we're talking about uh, is something that the Catholic Church also affirms. Now, do you see the irony of this? I, I have to point this out. So our great champions of reason and secular thought, uh, the, the authors I've mentioned, all the theoretical physicists who are atheists, want to shrivel human reason. The irony alert is that the Catholic Church is the only institution, as an institution that I know of, uh, that is a religious body, that promotes a broader understanding of what human reason can know. 
which is on the side of true knowledge, which is on the side of the grandeur of, of the human being and of reason's ability to know, which has the broader range and aspiration for what reason can know. It's the Catholic Church, the enemy of human reason, supposedly. So, so the question or comment was, what about universities that promote an expansionist view of human reason? What I was saying is in the context of proving the existence of God, the Catholic Church, in a very uh, singular way, for the last at least 1,800 years, uh, has promoted the ability of the human person to know the existence of God. You can go back to St. Paul, so call it 2,000 years, that human reason can know the existence of God from created reality alone. That's, that's the point I'm making uh, about that. So I just had to point out that, that irony because in the popular press, of course, the Catholic Church is always presented as the enemy of human reason, or you get these silly articles or TV shows on faith or science. And as we saw in class one, that's you know, drop down laughable. Okay, two more principles and then we'll jump into the, uh, the arguments themselves. So one of the principles in logic is the principle of non-contradiction. A is not not A. It's sometimes referred to as a principle of identity, like uh, Popeye, I am what I am. <laughs> uh, but what it means is things are what they are and they can't be not what they are in the same time in the res same respect. So the examples I give, a triangle cannot not have three sides and have three sides. You can't say Ty Cobb had a lifetime <laughs> batting average of 367 and he did not have a lifetime batting average of 367. So I know that this sounds obvious to you, but it's not obvious always, and it's the principle of non-contradiction. <laughs> so think of Eastern religions and Eastern thought for a moment. They would not necessarily agree with this. The principle of causality actually derives from the principle of non-contradiction. So when we talk about causes and their effects, What's the basis of making that distinction? The basis of making that distinction is the fact that things either have a quality or perfection in themselves or they receive it from another. And uh, this is the basic metaphysical basis for talking about causes and effects. An effect has a certain perfection, a cup of hot tea. Where did the heat in the tea come from? Does it come from the nature of tea? It does not. It was caused by a heat source. So that effect of heat in the tea had a prior requirement of something else causing the heat in the tea. That is a implication of the principle of non-contradiction. Things are what they are, they aren't what they are not. An example of that is in a lot of Eastern cosmologies, uh, you have examples of states of being that are inherently contradictory. So, a good God and an evil God, an equal majesty, equal infinite power. Some, some do. Uh, the notion of reincarnation is a poor man's version of a violation of the principle of nine. You can come back, and you can come back in different forms, in different ways, different life forms, different states in life, different times in history. Is, is that I, you, persisting in all those different lives? So these, these two arguments are the textbook arguments from medieval times. The Kalam argument developed by Arab Persian philosophers in the 8th, 9th, 10th century. Kalam means speech in Arabic. These are the classic cosmological arguments for the existence of God. The one on the right panel is taken from St. Thomas's uh, Summa Theologica in the first section on the doctrine of God. And we'll just run through them quickly, but you'll see if the premises are true, the conclusions follow validly. If we look at the Kalam uh, cosmological argument, it goes, everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. That's controversial, believe it or not, uh, but we can see how metaphysically that is something that could be justified. Everything that begins to exist 
as a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist, as we have seen and shown. Therefore, the, the universe has a cause of its existence. That can't be the universe. Whatever that cause is, it can't be a thing in the universe. Because that thing we call the universe began to exist. So something outside of the universe caused it to exist. And they'll quickly conclude to the existence of God. So you'll note that this is based upon the idea that whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. That's the linchpin of that argument. If you look at the Aquinas argument from motion, we'll also use the notions of causality, but we see things in nature that are in motion, things that are moving. Things that, are, that move either are self-moved or receive motion from another. So think of a billiard ball on a pool table uh, and it's hit by the cue ball and it starts moving. It received its motion from another, something that was actually moving. There's that potency act distinction coming in again. Aquinas goes on to say, the process of movers and things moved cannot go back to infinity. Why not? There would be no first mover. If we have to go back to an infinity of sequences, you don't have a first mover. And if you don't have a first mover, there's no subsequent movement. There has to be a first unmoved mover. If you sit at a railroad crossing and you get there late and the train cars have been passing, usually when you're late, <laughs> do you say, wow, uh, those rail cars are moving themselves? Or do you say, no, there's an engine that's moving them? But suppose your atheist friend said to you, who's sitting next to you, well, wait a minute, I can explain the motion of those rail cars by just saying there's an infinity of them. There's an infinite number of rail cars. That's why they're moving. Has that explanation explained the being of the motion of the rail cars? No, it's deferred it indefinitely. That's the substance of Aquinas' argument for motion and causality. That things that are in motion can't give an explanation of themselves. We need something that is a mover that is itself unmoved. So that argument is 700 years old. Father Robert Spitzer, in his book, uh, New Proofs for the Existence of God, uh, wanted to present a more modern contemporary argument in light of the findings in physics, quantum mechanics, relativity, and those disciplines. So he'll use slightly different language for that reason. And uh, this is an interesting argument. We'll go slow. and. The good news is the last heavy lifting slide in the deck. All right, so, You thought this was just about cookies and cheese in the back, didn't you? Okay. But he talks about two things. Conditioned reality is any reality that's dependent on something else for its existence or occurrence. So a wet sidewalk is dependent on a source of moisture. It's a conditional reality. And in fact, our entire experience of the universe, or our neighborhood, or our city, is conditioned realities. They depend on other things for their existence or occurrence. Can anyone name anything that doesn't require, that is not a conditioned reality? You are a conditioned reality. You're not necessary. And you depend on other things for your existence, namely your parents and the food you ate today. What's an unconditioned reality? A reality that does not depend upon another reality for its existence or occurrence. It's unconditioned. No conditions are required. So those are the definitions of the terms. So now here's the argument. The claim Father Spitzer makes in his book is that 
an unconditioned reality must exist in order to explain any conditioned reality. Now we know there are conditioned realities and, and perhaps we might think there's nothing but conditioned realities. That's our experience. So the counterclaim is a conditioned reality either depends on a finite or infinite number of other conditioned realities for its existence. Not both, not neither, one or the other. You see how this form of thinking, this is metaphysics, is different than chemistry and biology. We're trying to give an ultimate explanation of all cases, of all conditions, of reality. That's metaphysics. So here's the argument. If a conditioned reality depends on a finite number of prior conditioned realities, then the fundamental or first conditioned reality in the sequence is itself under conditions that are not fulfilled and therefore doesn't exist. Namely, the first conditioned reality in that sequence. It's a conditioned reality. And as we saw, the definition of a conditioned reality is something that requires something else for its existence or occurrence. So we haven't explained anything by saying, well, a finite number of conditioned realities explain all conditioned realities. We haven't explained anything at all. Why? Because that sequence is itself in need of explanation. It's not sufficient. And we saw this in the first class. Physics by itself is insufficient to explain the origin and being of the universe. This is just the metaphysical argument of that. So what's the other option we have? The only other option we have is if a conditioned reality depends on an infinite number of conditioned realities. But as we see, if there is no fundamental condition in the infinite number of conditioned realities, then the current conditioned reality under consideration, namely the current one we're considering, is always one plus x conditions away from being achieved. That's the definition of an infinite number of conditioned realities. One plus x. Whatever sequence you're considering, there's always another one that can be considered, and another, and another, and another. In other words, it's not an achievable sequence. And this is analogous to when we are talking about earlier about the impossibility of past time infinities. One of the reasons why it's infeasible and unintelligible is it's not achievable. It's not actualized. It's potentially there. It's not actualized. So, an infinite number of conditioned facts, realities, physical laws, does not explain anything because that sequence is not achievable. Both arguments fail. We are thus forced to conclude that an unconditioned reality must exist to explain any conditioned reality. Anything else is contingent, not necessary, and in need of explanation. Therefore God exists. Therefore a cause of our universe exists that is itself not part of the universe and is unconditioned. It needs nothing else for its existence. This is the classic definition of God in classical philosophy and Thomistic metaphysics. And it's the basis for our doctrine of God in the Catholic faith. These are the core arguments for the existence of God and I have never seen a refutation of them. I look high and low and I believe the truth is there is no refutation of them. So we have just knocked out one of the core linchpins of a secular society. You should feel proud. <laughs> You've earned it. 
what's that linchpin? That the question of God can't be answered. That religion is organized superstition. Certainly not the basis for forming society. Why on earth would you appeal to God, who's just a product of religious fantasy, as a basis for organizing society or an understanding of the human person? When we know from the natural sciences that we have no need for a creator, we can explain origins of the universe without appealing to uh, you know, Santa Claus in the sky. That is in the air. That's in your curriculum. That's what's waiting for you in high school and college and in the culture. That's what's in our political discourse. Why do people resist this? Why do they resist the fact that God can be known by natural reason? As we said in class one, it has moral implications. It has ethical implications. So we resist, secular society resists this and is content with this odd fundamentalism we see in physics. So, with our time left, uh, how to think about all this then? And then we'll get to the problem of suffering. So, from a philosophical point of view, so I'm not talking about the God that Jesus Christ reveals. I'm talking still a philosophical point of view. What is God? Who is God? God is this pure act of existence without limitation. He is the infinite perfection of all that is good and perfect and true. Without limitation. Now what the atheistic scientists will often proclaim is that, well, we don't understand that because they have no sense of anything outside of this universe. Which is why I wrote God is, is not another being in the universe. He doesn't possess his being infinitely the way we possess our being finitely. He doesn't have more being than we do. This is what people like Hawking don't understand. God is not a cause of the universe the way we would say heat is the cause of the tea being hot. He's not a, a mechanical cause in that sense. Rather. He is the basic ground of all reality. So you can say in an analogous sense he is hot and causes heat, absolutely, but God himself is not heat, unless you want to think of it as the fullness of, the, of that perfection. So when we talk about God, we really can technically talk about God philosophically in two ways. Negatively, what God is not. He's not a body. He's not stuck in 2016 temporally. He's not five foot seven, doesn't wear spectacles, etc. So God is not. That's one way we can talk about God. Another is we can talk about him by analogy. God is love, but more. Because our analogy of, of love is human love. But God is like human love, but more, infinitely more. There's something interesting that comes out of this. If God is the fullness of perfection, lacking nothing, he doesn't need to create anything. Doesn't. Doesn't need to create a thing. He is the fullness of perfection. So the fact that we are here, the fact that he did create, implies a decision that he made. So he chose to create. And that, in a certain way, mysteriously prefigures, not even talking about religion, a destiny for us. That we are made in his image in a certain way. Because he, a personal act, philosophically speaking, made him create. Because he didn't need to do it. And yet, here we are. This, then, is the opening for awe, wonder, and raising the question of what are those religions, what is Christianity, 
what is Catholicism talking about? Because the fact that I'm here and the fact that I now know God exists from natural reason seems to imply a destiny, seems to imply that I'm here not as some cosmic afterthought, but that I have a personal destiny and that God created me for a reason. Let's quickly, because waiting for us are the arguments against all of this. And the classic ones from people like uh, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, are you can't argue from finite reality to something infinite. It's disproportionate. You can't go from the facts before us to something spiritual, infinite, outside of our direct experience. That's true in this sense that we can't know much about God just from examining created reality and the doctrines of metaphysics. But we can conclude that something exists that is unconditioned and infinite. You know, the analogy I use and I put here is that if you looked at a building, uh, you might get a feel for what inspired the designer if you studied design and architecture. You might get a feel for what era the architect or the designer lived. Uh, you'd not get much more than that, though. But you'd at least get to this. There had to have been a designer and architect of the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower now. If we looked at Mount Rushmore, would we say, oh, isn't that amazing what wind and erosion can do? <laughs> no, we conclude that it's disproportionate. There had to be something that designed it. We, we can't know, for example, that it was, uh, I looked this up before the class, Gustav Berglun, a Dutch uh, or Danish-American who designed and sculpted Mount Rushmore. And did you know that initially it was going to be going all the way down to their waist. So Washington had a nice little coat, and, but they didn't get that far because Gustan died. So they just had to keep it at the torsos and up uh, at Mount Rushmore. Uh, but my point in all that is that we can't know much about the designer, the builder, the cause of the being of the universe, but we can know that he exists. It's going to take something more to know about his inner life. He's going to have to send a representative who's on the inside, who knows what the Father is. Stephen Hawking in his book will mention, if God caused the universe, who caused God? We now know through our journey through metaphysics that that's a silly objection. God is not a cause in the universe like a mechanism in the universe. God is not in the universe in this sense. God is obviously present to the universe, but he's not in the universe the way Stephen Hawking thinks is a mechanical cause. This opens up the, the question of the problem of evil, which we'll consider next. But before we do, are there any questions on what I've covered so far? So the question is, what is the background of Father Robert Spitzer? So he's a Jesuit, uh, but he is the former president of Gonzaga University. Uh, he has a PhD in theology and one in physics. Uh, and he is one of the few people, I'm sorry to say, who uh, is taking on the modern arguments in science and defending a philosophical point of view that's very congenial to the Catholic faith. I can't tell you how many texts in metaphysics and philosophy are just talking to themselves and they don't engage the popular culture of what's happening in the sciences. And it's a problem because people will go away to school and be uh, educated in a certain way that the natural sciences disprove the need for God and nothing could be further from the truth. But it's also one of those linchpins of our secular, atheistic, progressive society. That God's existence is a matter for religion. And a moral code, a moral law, that's just preferences. 
that people have. Like I like French vanilla, you might like uh, Rocky Road uh, ice cream. Morality is taste and preference. And God's existence is a matter for religion. We can't know anything about that. That's the soft underbelly of the secular society. It's, and it has real, no intellectual foundation at all. And we'll talk more about that uh, in the last class. Yes? So classical metaphysics could contemplate multiple universes, absolutely. There's no reason to think from a metaphysical point of view that ours is the only universe. Uh, you still have the problem of, you've just kicked the problem upstairs to the set of universes now. So we would just shift the argument to not this universe, but the set of all universes now need explanation. You sometimes will read literature on bouncing universes, crunchings. It sounds like a hot yoga class. But <laughs> you still haven't explained anything. It's, you still don't escape the law of entropy, for example. So how did our universe, if it's coming at the tail end of crunches and bounces of millions of universes, it's a very specified uh, and ordered thing that has come at the end of a long sequence. We know that that's absurd. We'll talk about it at the end, but there's nothing contradictory about the existence of black holes in our Catholic faith. But we'll, we'll talk more about it. What you said about universes and galaxies, the idea of what the Hubble is. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Good. Right. How come you're not sitting next to your wife? Okay. All righty. Apropos of the problem of suffering. No, oh, oh, that's terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to get the juices flowing. We've had metaphysics. We've had so. Okay. So again, we're we're looking at this from a philosophical point of view as we start this page. So often you will, if you talk to your agnostic friends or atheistic friends, uh, they will push back on our idea of God. Because how can there be a good God, uh, an infinitely powerful God, an infinitely loving God, a personal God who created us with a destiny, when there is this suffering and violence in all civilizations throughout history on such a large scale? You know, man's inhumanity to man has not abated. Uh, and in some ways has grown to just monstrous proportions in the 20th century and into the 21st century. And there's a real wounded sense in the question of these things are inconsistent. The question I always ask is where does the uh, injury that the person is expressing come from? Where do the ideas of evil and injustice that an atheist or an agnostic might verbalize come from? Why would an atheist or an agnostic be upset over the atrocities of uh, Auschwitz or Dachau? Now, they might be for personal reasons. My family was there, and that's a good reason. But say 200 years pass. Uh, what, what would be the basis for the outrage? Where does this idea of injustice come from? And an order that has been violated. That doesn't seem to come from our genes or our natural sense of self-preservation that some will talk about. So where does the horror of these crimes against humanity come from? It doesn't seem something that Darwin and evolution would select as a useful advantage for survival. As I mentioned, we don't see animals in the animal kingdom agonizing over this. Not really. And, and if we do think we see it, it's typically us imputing it to the animals. Why not? It, could it be that animals have no concept of truth and love in a person or an order that that person created? I would argue, and, and I would argue with 
these folks. It's, it's because we already, always already are visited by God in our conscience and in the created order that we see with our eyes that there's a person behind events, laws, and circumstances of our life. We become angry, but you can only really be angry with a person. You know, the examples I give of you're on a crowded bus, a CTA bus down in Chicago, and you trip over someone's leg and you fall, and you spill everything on the ground. Now, if that was an accident, you're, you're maybe more embarrassed than anything else. Now, suppose someone trips you on purpose. They stick their leg out and down you go. Same physical reality. Maybe you skin your knee the same way. Papers on the ground, same way. You're angry the second time, but not the first. Why? Because you sensed a person with choice did that on purpose. So what I'm getting at here is we don't, as we're going down when we trip by accident, uh, hopefully we don't curse out the law of gravity, or we don't curse at all. But do you blame the law of gravity? Do you get upset with a law? Of course not. You do get upset with a person, which is suggestive, isn't it? That there's something behind the law. There's something behind the events of your life that is not some non-directed cosmic force, but rather is personal. So this is really how I would wrap up our session tonight, is that atheism is really this wounded cry against a person, against the dominion and power of God in the world. Otherwise, we would have no reason to get upset, truly. It would just be unfortunate, like being tripped by accident. This is the philosophical answer to the agnostic, to the atheist. We, of course, as Catholics or as Christians, know that suffering has meaning, that it has been taken on by someone who was in the know, and that that person makes suffering redemptive and meaningful. So this is the door into uh, many topics, but it's ultimately the door into that we love a God who suffered and doesn't float to his throne on clouds, but stumbles to it through the stations of the cross. And it is through that humiliation that we actually get a sense into the real personal love of God for all of us. This is the basis for, then, believing in God, a personal God, a loving God. Any questions, then, before we wrap up? Yes, so the comment was, we know from our own experience that good can come out of bad. And that is certainly true. Sometimes that's not as easy or a direct line as, as we all know. Uh, Sometimes that explanation doesn't make sense in the moment of when the bad thing is happening. And in fact, to say it would be inappropriate. It's, it's often months and years later that you can make that kind of statement. But in the moment, sometimes things are just completely dark. Coming attractions. So next class will be more spicy. This was philosophical, theological, metaphysical. Another linchpin of secular culture is that the Christian religions are dangerous. Theocracies breed violence on a scale much greater than if we just had benign secular rulers pulling the levers of society and government, much what we have today. So what are the, if at your barbecues and cocktail parties, what are the two examples that are always given as Christianity, if we ever let those people back in control, this is what you get. The Crusades, we will cover next week. And the Inquisition, someone read ahead. <laughs> those are the two prime cuts, the, the choice examples 
of how secular atheists think about, well, if we let religious people back in charge, or we, if we have laws based upon the Judeo-Christian ethic, this is where it heads. And we're, we will show, we will compare that to secular governments and regimes, and we'll compare the body counts, among other things. So I think you'll find it highly provocative. I'll talk to you after class. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>